trust your experience and be open to more. I'd like to welcome to the show, Anne Elliott. Thank you so much for being here today, Anne. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. This is um, the title of your book, From Mainstream to Mystical, <laughs> really resonates with me. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation about how to, you know, what is that other side that's not the logical linear side? And, and what does that look like in practice? So um, I'd love to have you start off, just introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to be here. And um, I guess I should say I'm a practical Midwesterner, and I worked in a number of fields, brand management, and marketing, supply chain. I started my own company in uh, 1996, and then slowly the trajectory has bent, bent itself more towards the non-logical area than uh, the practicality of things like supply chain and uh, some of the other things that I've done professionally. And during the pandemic, while I wasn't traveling and was spending a lot of time uh, away from other humans and distractions, uh, I decided to start writing a book. And the book is about the last 20 years, starting with hiring a business presentation coach and then the ebbs and flows all the way through to where we are today. And the second edition just went live on the solstice, yay, on yay. the 20th of June. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about this. And I'm um, excited about the opportunity to introduce things to particularly business people who may be curious, but not really be placing so much value on the nonlinear, the stuff that's not as practical and that's a little more on the mystical side. Right, right. Well, and it's interesting. I noticed that when I read your book that your journey has been, well, I mean, obviously it's been your whole lifetime, but you really highlight the last 20 years for right. you. And I don't know if you and I talked about this, but it's been about 22 years for me of being on this journey of, oh, there's more than just the logical linear tangible side of things so it was really fun to kind of see your journey through that and for anyone who is curious it's a really fun journey lots of fun stories to listen to I wanted to read one thing it's actually toward the end of the book but I just want to read it so okay. that listeners can um, place themselves um, in a particular energetic stance and then I'd love for you to respond to it from here right now Great. All right. So you write, human existence requires material resources. And I find that when I am aligned with a purpose, a soulful mission, or an opportunity for deeper learning, resources abound. Support often comes when I let go of logic and allow synchronicity or intuitive guidance to become apparent. I love it. And I'd love to hear where's your stance on that right now? Yeah, the same. And uh, this is the work that I do with my clients in a coaching environment is exactly the same thing. I tend to attract people who are very logical, linear, often leaders in their field. And it sometimes is difficult to let go of all that logical, practical, how to what if I can't see the path in order to let the synchronicities drop in. And I think there's um, a myth that spiritual people go off in caves and they don't have need for material resources. And I would say I'm living a life that disproves that theory because I'm very spiritual, but I'm also very grounded in material resources. And I like having a high quality of life. I'm not interested in living in a cave. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> So yeah, if we did that in another lifetime, Anne. <laughs> yeah, that's very possible. Um, I like hiking in caves, mm -hmm. and I read about that in uh, chapter 30 on France, mm -hmm. but I don't really want us to live in one. I like living with modern conveniences, mm -hmm. and so that was one of the things that I hoped the book would do, was dispel the myth that if you're spiritual or you have command of these mystical or intuitive or synchronistic gifts 
that all of a sudden you have to give up the material world. And I think that's what many of us are here to bridge mm -hmm. the mainstream and the mystical. It's so true. I mean, where I don't know exactly where that came from, but I definitely that was a thought that I had at some point in my journey as well. It's like, oh, well, if you go down this path, that's kind of you're over there. <laughs> you know, and I like you, I love, I love adventuring. I love traveling. I I love things that feel good where the I I I call it the vibration of it feels really aligned, right? And um, and that can look different in different ways and doesn't necessarily equate just to money but it's right. why not why not why not all you know I, I I think I don't know about you but did you I, I grew up where there was a lot of pressure to do things a certain way and there was kind of this ladder of if you do xyz then this will be success for example and I felt like I as a young kid picked up on that and started pushing down some of my natural gifts tell me a little bit about your childhood and <laughs> <laughs> what you remember. Yes. Well, I think that I had a lot of those gifts at a young age. And then I quickly figured out that if I wanted to have my parents be comfortable, I would not point out the elephants in the room or whatever else was in the room. Right. And also, um, in order to win acceptance of uh, family and extended family, the things that were esteemed were achievement oriented mm -hmm. and things that we would think of as being analytical or cultural success. Um, the things that were chalked up in that way, not so much your ability to read intuitively a particular situation or predict an outcome. Now, I would say there's been some wiggle room in some of my family's perceptions. And I kind of laugh that they not just my family, but that people in general will have disdain for your intuitive gifts until they need them. And then <laughs> until, <laughs> until it values, in, until there's some value for them, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden when they've misplaced their wallet or they can't find something that they need, all of a sudden your phone is ringing and they're like, could, could you just look oh. and tell me if you have any ideas about where it might be? It's kind of a running joke in a, in a way, but <laughs> you did mention that in your book, right? Where it's like, oh, well, actually, Anne, could you <laughs> yes. uh, could you check for this? Yeah, yeah. And I think while I love um, being able to help, um, sometimes people don't want to believe that that's possible and that's okay. I'm willing to right. accept people wherever they are in their journey. And then the other part of that is I like to help people learn how to use their own gifts mm -hmm. because I think um, we're all wired differently. We all have different strengths and capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think the Figuring out the finesse to utilize what is unique to you is very important to me as a gift that I have to give to others. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, I was thinking back to when I was a little kid and uh, until I started picking up that it was making people uncomfortable, I just assumed as a kid that everyone was experiencing <laughs> it, right? And even now, as I've gone on this journey, reconnecting with all of that, there's a recognition that how how my gifts show up in my life is very different than someone else's. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we can't all tap into some of the different gifts that are there, but it we're all unique human beings. So the way that it shows up, the way that it expresses itself is, is very different. And I love how in the book, you give many different examples of how your gifts have shown up, you know, over a period of time and, and in, in a variety of different situations. I really resonated with, it's funny you brought up the chapter about France. That was the chapter that I wanted to ask you about. Perfect. I don't know, synchronicity. There you go. <laughs> um, that area in France, mm -hmm. La saint Bon, yes. is, I've been there. I went right before, right before the pandemic. And I felt called there. And it was an unbelievably powerful experience. So when I started reading that chapter, and that was exact, it's not exactly a place that a lot of people talk about, you know, it's, it's far enough away from Nice and Khan, and it's far enough from um, the, the west side of, of the country. But can you share a little bit for the audience about that experience for you and what that what you what you experienced, but also what you took with you as you left? France. Oh, wow. 
we could go in two three hours, words, <laughs> yeah, in two hours and not cover it all. And that's funny because um, we did a lot of hiking in that area. And as you know, there are quite a lot of caves there. Yeah, in fact, yeah. that's one of the signature features of that particular hike. So um, I, I think that was probably one of the more like, like Egypt, uh, one mm -hmm. of the more deeply spiritual and metaphysical experience of my life. And maybe that was at least in part, the intention of going mm -hmm. there was to explore uh, more of that. Um, the area is well known for being the grotto where Mary mm -hmm. Magdalene did a lot of her work. And that's part of why I was there was training and traveling with some people who are interested in that. So um, I think it's really hard to put words to everything that I experienced and everything that I gained while I was there. But there's a particular moment that's in the book. It's just as um, we're coming out of the forest after hiking, it's a couple thousand feet, I think, or maybe 1800 feet to the top of the peak. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a moment where I stopped and it felt like I was watching a time capsule being unpacked in in my awareness somehow it's very difficult to put words to this because you, not yeah for people who can, yeah is it a is it a visual is it a knowing what how do you how do you experience or how did you experience that yeah so i would say that was both a visual followed by a knowing and this okay. is sometimes the way my process works i will get a visual that makes sense to me in in like a, a literal capsule and then I'll have an awareness of that's a capsule. And now I feel like whoosh, everything is opening. It sounds really woo woo, <laughs> but learn to utilize this for practical uh, purposes. And um, it is a part of your own process. It's really quite powerful. So um, there are different ways. People, people each have their own unique ways. And mine has been unfolding for many, many years, probably beyond the 20 that are chronicled right. in the book. But in that case, yes, I was standing. I can remember this like I'm still there. I was standing in a particular place. It was a beautiful day. Everything was green. And we were just about to cross back over a footbridge where we had entered the forest area we were mm -hmm. where we were hiking. And I had this sudden awareness that something's going on here. There's something happening. And yeah. oftentimes it takes a while, and I mean a while like months or even years to understand exactly what it is that's unfolding. At that's such a great thing for people to hear, right? Because I, I know that people in the audience have probably experienced some of these things, but not been able to, for whatever re reason, make a connection to what is this? What does it mean? It could be either like me when I was a kid, like everyone experiences this, right? Or when you realize that, oh, maybe you say it out loud and someone kind of looks at you like, what are you talking about? <laughs> It's just a forest, right? Yeah, and I th I think there's a really great way in which we can demystify the mm -hmm. mystical. And I think the more practical applications there are for that, the more we tend to stop dismissing it as being right. this stuff that other people do. And that's why um, I think it's good to try and put words to it because it helps other people to understand. And right. at the same time, it's very difficult to put words to it. Sometimes right. people get it and they know exactly what you mean. And other times they're going, yeah, right, right. sure, right. Or a time capsule, okay. <laughs> well, see, and for me, when I, when I read it and when you just said it just now, I get body goosebumps. And I don't know if that's just because of my own experience there and how powerful it was, but, or, or it's a resonance with what I'm feeling. Cause I tend to feel or know things, the visual as well sometimes, but the, it's like the feeling comes first or the knowing comes first. And then it needs to be unpacked a little bit after that. Um, and I just say that because everyone, everyone's different. Like we said a little bit ago, and someone listening might think, well, this is kind of weird, this thing that happened. I mean, you and I both have experience with clients where we might be talking about one thing and we get a visual, we get a feeling, we get a knowing, and then knowing when, you know, maybe you can speak a little bit to how you know when the timing is right to offer offer it to the person. <laughs> oh, I've had to learn that along the way because not everyone wants to hear what you're seeing in your head all the time. And also, um, 
sometimes there's a, a way in which um, the universe, I'll call it the universe for mm -hmm. lack of a better term, will give you an image that you recognize. And then it's almost like free association to understand what the meaning is. So um, I might see something that looks like a, a capsule or a pill, but I don't take any pharmaceuticals and I haven't in, I don't know, probably over 20 years. And so I would know immediately that it's not, not yours. some part of me telling me, oh, you forgot to take your fill in the blank, whatever medicine today, right. it's a metaphor. So, but the fact that it didn't look like something that came out of a spaceship, that kind of <laughs> capsule, or sometime a time capsule that was buried mm -hmm. underground, the universe will give me something that I can recognize and then extrapolate that into whatever the meaning was. And I think that's the gift that we can help by, by demystifying it and right. talking about it. That's the gift that we can offer to, to others who think, mm -hmm. well, I see all these weird things, or I hear sounds, or I have these full body tingles or whatever it is, and not make that wrong or weird right. or anything. It's right. just <laughs> part of your process and you're working to understand what the meaning is. And have you noticed that over time as you have, well, no, let me ask you this question first. Was there a time where this was starting to, where you were really looking, exploring, training, however you want to look at it, researching, I say researching, because that's kind of what I do, where you felt that you couldn't share this with a big part of your world? Did you ever have that feeling? Well, I think it depends on the audience. Mm -hmm. So, and that's part of why I wrote the book is because there have been these instances where I knew it wasn't the right thing to share in the moment. And then maybe later it was. Mm -hmm. um, there's a story about being in a board meeting for um, a group of people at Duke University. And I was definitely getting information, but I knew it wasn't. I the think time. I know which story you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very vivid, the visualization, correct? Yes, right, <laughs> right. And you, you know, in a room full of people in a board meeting, mm. that is absolutely not the time to share right. that. But then about eight hours after that happened, there was a different group of people in a different setting back at the hotel where we were all staying. And the universe put together all the circumstances for me to be able to share the information. And the best part was the person who I was sharing it with validated it. Right. And oftentimes when you're doing intuitive work, you don't get the validation. Either you don't get the opportunity to share it or the person says, I don't know what you're talking about. And so it takes them a few months to register what, yeah. what, what you shared. Yeah. And so sometimes the validation is so precious just because it reaffirms your, your own understanding of the way your process works. Mm -hmm. What are you most excited about when you look, if you go really big picture and you look at all of your experience in, in business and yeah. all of your experience experiences in this more mystical realm, what are you most excited about for humanity, for business, for leaders going forward? Yeah, thank you for asking that because it's something I'm passionate about and something I I started dropping a few hints about that in the later chapters of the book. Like what if every corporation had a chief intuitive officer mm -hmm. or, um, you know, corporate wellness has become a thing um, that's been very popular and it's a field I've worked in and companies save millions, if not tens of millions of dollars through their wellness programs. But at what point will wellness embrace some of the alternative and holistic right. modalities? So I'm very passionate about that. And then um, also, I think um, as we broaden just not from something like um, a wellness program or a chief intuitive officer or something like that, which is a little tongue in cheek when I write some of that, but what if we were able to utilize and find value in some of those unique gifts that people bring and I, mm -hmm. I that, that are unconventional. And I did write about that. Like, what if your LinkedIn profile had some kind of, uh, you know, you made a direct reference to your mystical right. gifts as well as your college degree and your past <laughs> five jobs. Wouldn't that would be so amazing. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. that be fun? I mean, wouldn't you be really curious? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be and, something I'd be curious about looking up on different people. Ooh. Right. And uh, I noticed when I was doing um, the first edition of the book that LinkedIn, like, I forget, I think it was like 2023, like more than half of the top 20 LinkedIn courses online 
were what we call soft skills. Now, I don't think we have anybody on, or we didn't at the time, that was actually teaching on intuition. Right. But what if we did? Well, if right. that was a LinkedIn certification that you could get as part of your profile. Mm -hmm. I, I think stuff like that is really interesting. And I know we spend a lot of time talking about artificial intelligence. <laughs> and I think about, wow, there's so much of uh, other kinds of intelligence that we haven't explored yet, but okay. You yeah, know? but, and you know, what's interesting about that, what I think of with artificial intelligence is we could offload some of that logical linear stuff that doesn't require as much of the intuitive piece and at the same time be growing and expanding in that intuitive piece which then would be something that would set you apart right and right. and and bringing value that isn't necessarily that we can't necessarily tap into I, don't, I i guess i can't say ever but at least not right now you can't tap into that with artificial intelligence right. what are your th what are your thoughts on that that well, interface think, between ai yeah, and, and i i I think it's um, I think it's unfolding so fast right now, but mm -hmm. I think when we spend so many hours on these beautiful things that allow us to communicate long distance this way, right. we sometimes <laughs> don't spend as much time cultivating the talent to communicate without the technology. And I very much right. know from my personal experience that that technology, not artificial, but you know, innate, right. innate, and natural, mm -hmm. exists. And I mean the the uh, synchronicity a few minutes ago about me talking about France and you mm -hmm. wanting to ask me about that chapter. We're all mm -hmm. so interconnected in so many ways. And again, if I had back to your great, very expansive question <laughs> about humanity and what, what, how we could use this. And I, I think we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. And that's great, but what if we did that on a bigger scale that embraced people's unique gifts, yeah. not just gender, skin right. tone, ethnicity, things like that? I right. just think there's so much room to expand the definition of that. I love that. I've got body goosebumps again. And that for me, for me, I'll just share with the audience, that means for me, something feels very aligned, right? And what I'm hearing, what I'm experiencing <laughs> feels very aligned for me and what my values are and what's important yeah. to me. And I... I I agree with you. I mean, what we all are so unique, right? Like, I don't know why in childhood, it seems like you try so hard, uh, maybe teenagehood, you're trying so hard to fit in. I know that is was definitely part of my story. I got to fit in. I got to be normal. I got to fit in. I got to be normal. Why? Wouldn't the greatest gifts from everyone be if we just could be fully who we are, even with all that innate, intuitive side of us? Well, I think that's the journey. We're right. here to figure out who we really are and certainly who I really was at this time I started writing about in the book is not who I am today. <laughs> and the values and the ways in which I define success are much different mm -hmm. now than they were 20 years ago when I was starting a company and trying to get presentation coaching so that I could do better at conferences. I mean, all, all that has shifted and I think it is for other people, mm -hmm. not just for you and me. Speak a little bit more to that idea that the definition of success is shifting because you did say at the beginning yeah. of the show that you're very much rooted or grounded in the, you know, planet Earth, the 3D, the material aspect, yeah. and not going to go live in a cave. So speak a little bit to how that definition of success has shifted for you and what, what it means, because I think it, to me, it sounds like you're embracing even more, but I'd oh. love to hear Oh, absolutely. And um, by the way, there's a part in the book, and I don't know exactly which chapter it's in, but I uh, was applying for um, a consulting position, not full-time, but um, part-time consulting position. And the application asked me to differentiate between success and accomplishment. And mm -hmm. I thought that was absolutely mm -hmm. genius because to me, I can point at I um, spoke at this conference, I did this client mm -hmm. project, I have you know, what, whatever the, right. the list of accomplishments, right? <laughs> right? But the list of accomplishments can leave you very hollow and empty mm -hmm. on the inside. Whereas if you feel a sense of fullness and satisfaction and success, that can be very different than what's on the accomplishment side. So yeah. yes, I spoke at some very prestigious conferences, even some at a very young age, um, uh, with a sitting president of the United States, but I would say what I have now as an expression of success is much different and much more fulfilling. And mm -hmm. also, I think 
as we leave traditional roles, perhaps in corporate America, perhaps someplace else, but as we leave traditional roles, we get to define what success mm -hmm. means. We're, we're no longer a slave to a performance review or the next bonus, right. whatever, whatever it's going to be. We now get to redefine that for ourselves. So if success is working four days a week instead of six, or success is having um, certain wellness practices that mm -hmm. really nourish you, there are all kinds of new definitions that aren't necessarily as quantifiable as they are mm -hmm. something you just feel inside right, right. and know is your definition of success. Yeah. And how have you, so the first edition came out in 20. 2023 three. and and when that came out talk a little bit about what what was it like to have this public have this out there put this out there well it's interesting um it was uh i don't know i felt like there was a big exhale mm -hmm. uh, and also i had been a part of um a group that studied the marketing not the actual writing of the book but we had all produced work and so my thought was, oh, I'm going to advertise on Amazon or I'm going to go do this book authors conference or whatever. And what's interesting is it actually uh, didn't work out the way I expected in that the book started attracting other people who were interested in exploring their gifts. And that's when I formulated a 12 week coaching program. Mm -hmm. Um, that addresses intuition and other things, as well as what's going on in the practical aspects mm -hmm. of life. So I went from thinking, oh, I'm an author to thinking, oh, I'm an expression out in the world. And now we're going to see <laughs> what comes as a result of that. And also, I think um, the second edition has more of the question you asked, which is, what does this mean um, if we look at this as a collective right. or for humanity or for corporations in mm -hmm. general rather than just individuals? I love that. And did was anyone surprised when they read your book? Um, fortunately, I uh, got to all of them before. <laughs> so my most people who are close to me knew that I was writing a book at the time, and um, particularly people who are in the book, even if their names have been changed, all of them were notified in advance or at least had some inkling that I was working on a book. And so, uh, yes, one of my greatest joys was actually delivering copies to my parents mm -hmm. on um, Easter weekend just before the book was um, publicly available for sale. So mm -hmm. that's that was a great accomplishment and I uh, honor them and their part in my process. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that honoring in the process. Right. And, and for anyone who's either listening now or read your book later, who maybe they can't go to France, like we talked about France and you, yeah. you have explored many different areas, um, including Egypt and, and maybe they can't do that right now. What would you, but they're kind of curious what yeah. would you want to say to that person? Well, there are so many small things that you can do um, during the course of the day uh, or without going to a spiritual retreat. In fact, um, one of the things that I learned during my time in Brazil was that my my path here in the world, in this incarnation, is not to go off and be a spiritual person living mm -hmm. someplace away. It's to integrate that energy into the mainstream, hence the book title from mm -hmm. mainstream to mystical and maybe back again. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one of the things that you can do is to um, allow some wiggle room. And that phrase is used in the book. And what I mean is allow wiggle room in your expectations and your perceptions. So we kind of have this thing uh, where our mind thinks, well, Jane did this, this, and this, and this is what it means. Well, okay, that's might be one thing that happened historically, but what if you allowed a, a little wiggle room and maybe Jane does things differently the next time you interact? Mm -hmm. And that can be around your expectations that are projections off of history. It can be around wiggle room in your schedule so that if some synchronicity happens, mm -hmm. it drops in, you have the wiggle room to allow it to, to, to uh, take advantage of it. Yeah. So I love, I love that part, the wiggle room and the calendar. Yeah. That's something at least with the leaders that I work with is often not the case unless they mindfully do it and creating that space. It doesn't mean that necessarily something's going to just big, huge thing is going to pop up, right. but it's creating space for 
what do you what whatever the word is that feels comfortable for people, but making space for universe to create magic, you know, yeah. is one way you could look at it. And also, if you look at it like you're on a treasure hunt and you're looking for clues, mm -hmm. then one thing leads to another, yes. to another, to another. And all of a sudden you found the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow or whatever. And another thing that I'll point out, because I use this a lot in um, uh, work with clients, when sometimes when they're setting expectations or maybe they have a manifestation technique that they're mm -hmm. using or... Um, they're really wanting something, I always recommend that they add the three words, this or better. Or be that's, I that, do that too. <laughs> sometimes if, if you are so focused on one thing, mm. you miss what's going on in the periphery or the panoramic yeah. vision that may be even more interesting to you if you aren't so laser focused. So I think it's chapter 40 is titled This or Better and actually yeah. tells the story of using those three words with a male client who was trying to do some uh, manifesting related to his professional life. Mm -hmm. That I, I resonate with that too, because we may not have the capability right now to even see something that's better. Right. And so if we just say that this or so, I, I, the way that I say it is this or something better, yeah. um, it's you're giving space for something that maybe right now you can't see that, you know, you can see this, but wow, if there is something, you know, when I used to do a lot of um, relationship work with people, you know, they get really locked into a, a partner looking, being a particular way. It's like, okay, so there are some things that matter to you, but what about this or something better, this or better. <laughs> it's space. I love that. So that's a really simple thing that anyone listening can do, yeah. creating space. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, a big message here is that we don't need everybody, the mystical, mystically inclined to go off and be in some kind of spiritual environment. We need to embody that energy here yes. in, in our third yes. dimensional yes. every day, day to day, whatever it is that we're doing. And I believe that that energy is part of our, I call it evolutionary trajectory towards higher states of consciousness. Yeah. And that that idea excites me so much and and really probably was the main factor in me wanting to have you on the show is that Thank you. it's not separate, right? And it doesn't it doesn't have to be separate. It's not either or. It's not either you're going down this path and and you're a monk who never interacts with anyone and and you have no money, you know, but but you're gifted food. or, you're in a leadership position in a company and you don't mess around with that. Why, why can't it be both? Right. And, and what might be possible? Right. Well, and I believe it's questions like that. Uh, and people like you and me who are here to do more of the integration work and to encourage others to do their own integration. Yeah. And what have you found um, just on LinkedIn? What has yeah. it been like to put this out there? I mean, that's how you and I connected. So I obviously, know. obviously there's, you know, yeah. there's some synchronicities happening there, but the majority of LinkedIn, as you mentioned earlier, doesn't really talk about this part. So how has it been to put this out there and be on LinkedIn and have the book yeah. name? What, ha what, what kind of experiences have you had? Well, it's super fun. Um, the best part of LinkedIn uh, has nothing to do with the number of uh, people who write comments or drop emojis. It's actually when I go to a meeting and someone who I don't know is following me or looking at my LinkedIn. They're right. not following me. They're just looking right. at LinkedIn says, hey, I really like that post you wrote about. And I'll say, I didn't know you follow me. And this actually happened oh. not too long ago. And his comment was, yeah, the one where the heron flies through your ring light while you're on a Zoom with a client. I thought, oh, wow. Okay. He's, really, he is really reading. Right. So, um, I, and also I've been offering excerpts of the book in a- mm. Oh, format. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. On a platform where you don't have to put in your email address. Mm -hmm. It's totally anonymous. And it's amazing that the number of hits and downloads that that really? gets, and it's transparent to me. I can't tell anything about where the person came from yes. or uh, other than the fact that there's a counter that says that this many people landed and this many people downloaded the file. 
that's all I know. And that's great if it right. gets the message out. And back to your original question about LinkedIn. So there are words and a profile, there's a picture and a bunch of other stuff. But the other thing that, um, and I, I coach on this as well as utilizing myself, there's a certain frequency that you put out. Mm -hmm. So even the people who may not resonate with the words still are feeling some part of that frequency and it's causing them to either want to read more, look, connect. Mm -hmm. They may not want to own the fact that they have an interest right. in the mystical or the metaphysical or the intuitive part or whatever. But this happens every week where someone who I don't know mm -hmm. is has any idea of my profile on any social media platform and yet I get a DM or an interaction at a meeting or something like that that tells me oh okay so something about that resonated yeah so it's um it's kind of curious you have to kind of check your ego because right. even if right you're, you're <laughs> you, you mean you're not comments. counting likes and comments <laughs> You know, yeah. check your ego because all of a sudden you walk into a board meeting and someone makes a comment about a post with a heron flying through your ring light and you're like, wow, wow. okay. So somebody was reading enough to have a recall of a post that was published three right. weeks ago and right. something about that stuck with them. And then it becomes a springboard to a deeper conversation right. about things that are going on. And I think that's, I mean, that's one of the things that I really want to bring to the audience with this show is a deeper conversation, right? A curiosity, a deeper conversation about things that maybe, maybe aren't talked about super comfortably in the majority of the population right now. Um, but giving that, giving people an opportunity to, you know, if you're listening right now, feeling, listening, maybe seeing. And just seeing what resonates, what doesn't. And and you take it and run with it, whatever it looks like in your life. Well, and my my favorite expression, and I put this in the book in several places, is one that I learned from my meditation teachers who were my greatest teachers about unconditional love because they showed me something. It's one thing to talk about unconditional mm. love. It's another to feel it inside. And their, their wisest... Um, uh, instruction to me was trust your experience and be open to more. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I said that is they never wanted to be my gurus. They never wanted me to put them on a pedestal or right. see, see them as somehow better than me. And so they would always say, when I would ask them a question, like, what do you think about this? Or is this real? Or is this right? They'd always say, trust your experience. Mm -hmm. and be open to more." I love that you bring that up. And I want anyone listening because a lot of people think that other people are the teachers, other people are the gurus, other people are the leaders. And that is true sometimes for a bridge from one, like a transition bridge. Right. And at the same time, what you just said, see if it, see if it resonates with you because I, I don't know about you, but in my exploration and research and this whole intangible area of who we are, every once in a while, something doesn't align for me. And I don't make it about that person is the, is the guru and therefore I have to follow. It's more like that resonates, that doesn't resonate. I take what feels really good and in alignment with me and let the rest of it go. And I just want to say that out loud for everyone because no one person has all the answers. Would yeah. you agree? Oh, at, not only would I agree, I would encourage you if you're studying with anybody who wants to be thought of as a guru, you might want to rethink that because in a way you're conferring all of your power onto yeah. them. And I think there's so much more available to you when you trust your experience and you're still open to more. So that was yeah. great. That came very early in my spiritual opening. Yeah. And I'm very grateful uh, that that was something that was given to me at, at such an early stage. Hmm. I want to ask you what story in your book was the most fun to write about? Oh gosh, there's so many. <laughs> Whichever one comes to mind now with everyone knowing that they can pick up the book and read all of those fun, fun stories, but one that's the most well, fun. Yeah. And the, and the other thing is um, I'm uh, I, on my website, I have a mailing list because I'm going to begin publishing some of the stories that were written that did not get put into the book. And I won't do that publicly for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons, but I will do it on um, to, for subscribers. So 
Um, we can talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, it might be the one, just because it's fresh in my mind, it might be the one about the Duke board meeting where I was getting a very clear transmission about something and left that meeting thinking I'll never know what that was about. And then six or eight hours later, I was put in the position to validate that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number of synchronicities that had to line up for that to happen is just remarkable. But there are so many. And the the funny thing the funny thing is, is what's running through the Rolodex of stories in my <laughs> head right now are all the ones that got chopped in the interest of keeping oh, interesting. less than 500 mm. pages. <laughs> yes. So yes. sign up for your mailing list. I was, on a, I was on a trajectory to write a much longer book. And at some point I was like, this is getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I, it was hard to cut some of those stories, but I know that they're still there simmering. And at some point <laughs> they, will, they will be birthed into uh, more of a public space. Well, why don't you share right now how how the audience can either get a hold of your book or or get on the mailing list to get some of those some of those additional stories? Yeah, so my website's really easy. It's my name Anne Elliot LLC dot com, and the book part of that um, is backslash book. So if you want to just go mm -hmm. to see the book, and uh, my last name's two L's and two T's, so there's a lot of double consonants in that. <laughs> LLC.com. That's one way. And then my LinkedIn profile, which is another easy way to find me. I'm Ann.W.Elliot on um, LinkedIn. And that usually will differentiate me enough that you'll find me on the first try. Great. And we'll put all of those are down below for everyone so that you can connect with Ann in whatever way feels right. Um, I want to ask you before we close for today, if you if you could grant one wish for humanity, what would it be? That everybody become more comfortable in expressing these gifts, because I really do think that they are part of a evolutionary trajectory into higher forms of consciousness. And the more we suppress them in order to fit in or to adhere to some kind of cultural idea of success, uh, we, we miss the value that are, that's innate in each of those. So mm. that would be my wish. And part of that's because that wish has been granted for me. Mm. I love that. Any last words that you'd like to share with the audience before we close today? Yeah, please. Um, hopefully enjoy the book. I'm very accessible um, email and social media, and I would love to hear what your thoughts are. And yes, know that there's more in the works. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.